All right, so eight mic recording. Uh, really convenient. I know a lot of us recording drums have eight mic, um, uh, eight channel uh, uh, preamps, eight channel sound cards. A lot of us starting off are buying eight channel uh, uh, sound cards, and um, so most of us have access to this. Uh, I I could be using more, but I'm enjoying the streamlined approach. Actually, I've been I've been opting to use just eight microphones for a four piece kit. I've been really liking it. And this uh, this mic array in particular, I think, works really well for uh, a room with low ceilings. Um, I think if you're in a studio with with high ceilings in a well treated room, then you know a, a, a stereo pair of overheads is is awesome. They always sound really cool. They should always sound really cool because uh, everything kind of has time to coagulate and be balanced, you know. But uh, in a room, a lot of us are recording in less than ideal rooms, and that's usually ceiling height. Mine over here is about seven and a half feet. And above the drum set, I have the ceiling raised a little bit to about eight feet. That's how I finished my ceiling. And, uh, you know, I, the square footage is, is, is not bad at all. I, I do have some floor space here. But, yeah, definitely low ceilings, and I know a lot of us are in the same situation. So... Uh, I've recorded with a stereo pair of overheads for years and I've made many records like that and it's very cool. But I think that we can get more mileage out of an eight mic recording or out of any recording, really, any number of microphones. Uh, if we kind of do away with that convention for this recording situation. So th this is nothing new. I'm not reinventing the wheel. What I've done is instead of using a stereo pair of overheads, I'm using a mono overhead and I'm using a Blumline uh, pair right in front of the drum set so not as a room like not not something distant that we would call room mics they're pretty up close to the uh to the kit and uh i'll discuss why i think that works a lot better in, in rooms at low ceilings and and then i'll actually we'll we'll go through mixing them together i i did a mix video for this and uh, decided i didn't like it so i i kind of Figured, let's start from scratch and instead of having all my plugins kind of set up and saying, okay, well, here I was cutting and here I was boosting, like, we'll, we'll go through it together. And I've been recording drums like this now for a couple of months and I kind of have my, uh, yeah, I have my way I like to go about things. So it shouldn't be, I hope it'll work out. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think the first thing we'll do is let's listen to all the individual mics um, without any processing. I just have a bit of limiting on the bus there so that we have some level. So here's a kick mic. I'm using one kick mic, uh, actually uh, not entirely true, but let's just say for now I'm using one kick drum mic. This is a Beta 52 uh, going into my APIs and into uh, my Apogee AD8000 converters. So here's a Beta 52. There's no hole in the reso head, as you can tell. There's our kick. Snare is a 57 into the APIs, into the Apogee AD8000. Nice. Uh, looks like we're coming up to some toms. Let's do the toms. The toms are at 421 on the top tom, and this RE20 uh, on the floor tom, and those are going straight into my Focusrite Scarlet Prees. So nothing crazy there, but I never feel like I'm missing anything. There are the toms. So th that's it for the close mics. Pretty straightforward. Uh, let's let's go to what I'm calling here the rooms, but this is the Blum line pair uh, in front of the drum set. And the microphones I'm using are uh, Warm Audio uh, 47 Fet Juniors. Um, and those are going into my APIs and into the AD8000s. So, um, yeah, I, so the API is getting kick, snare, and the stereo picture. I feel like uh, that's where I need the most fidelity, kick, snare, and, like, the person sitting down in front of the drum set listening, this Blumline pair. And um, what I like about this is that... Uh, it had occurred to me a couple of times while I was in a room with a drum set and somebody else was playing, for example, having somebody sit in on my kit 
or or just uh, being on a tour where um, it was a double bill, so there was actually another drummer on it, which doesn't always happen. And I noticed that cymbals sound better to me when you're actually in front of the drum set listening to them almost at the same level as them. Um, I just like that sound better. Uh, they, I, f I feel like they're warmer and lusher and fuller and we we tend to treat symbols like they're they're just um, this high end information, but uh, they're really a full range instrument with a lot of body in the mids, a lot of you know low mid and and lows even. And uh, I feel like out front we really capture a lot of that. So uh, usually with room mics we try to eliminate as much cymbal as possible and try to get as much of that drum sound. We want it, we usually like our room mics to extend our kick and snare and our toms and we we're hoping we're not overrun with cymbals, but I'm actually the way I have them set up is that uh, these are my my cymbal mics. I'm using them to capture my cymbals. I like the way the cymbals sound in them. And uh and and I want to represent that, you know. And the drums sound really cool in them too. Uh, I think what's really cool about the uh, the warm audio microphones is that um, for that price point to have uh, 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 large diaphragm condensers that are multi-pattern is really useful. Um, uh, first of all, I think a large diaphragm condenser is is, is going it, it's going to color the sound quite a bit more than a small diaphragm condenser, and um, you know maybe the more expensive ones will do a better job of it. Uh, the, 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 the 47 juniors sound good in cardioid too, but, uh, I think when you put these microphones in figure of eight or an Omni, they actually sound a lot more natural and open and inexpensive than, than, than their price would suggest. And, uh, what I'm looking for from these microphones and from this pair is realism. So it, very cool to have a pair of large diaphragm condensers. It's tough for drummers because we have to buy stereo pairs of things, you know. We can't just invest all our money on one cool mic. We kind of have to, you know, buy stereo pairs of things. So th these really worked out well for me. I like them very much. Um, so let's have a listen. Let me put that a little louder for you. The hi-hats are very definitely on the left, so a very clear stereo image to me for the cymbals, even though the kick and snare are a little skewed. But the cymbals feel warm and open and natural. So there you go. I wonder if, because they're in figure of eight and... Um, set up vertically perpendicular to the ceiling. I wonder if they're not rejecting a bit of ceiling too. I guess we're trying to maximize a lot of us, or I'm assuming some of us have more real estate uh, in terms of square footage than we do in terms of height. So why not, uh, why not capture that air instead of fighting this air, you know? Maybe there's some of that going on as well. Uh, that being the case, I've gone for a mono overhead. Uh, first of all, because... Uh, this is a biodynamic M260, and it's a hypercardioid ribbon mic, kind of like the M160, but it's a little different. And it's a really cool mic, and I only had one of them, so uh, there you go. And this is going into the Focus Red Scarlet, straight into the Focus Red Scarlet. And I do really like a mono overhead, and I have quite a few videos where I use uh, this microphone or dynamic mic microphones as a, a mono overheads, or the Warm Audio 47 Junior as well. And um, I think what I like about a mono overhead is that uh, we often set up, I mean, the way a drum set is set up is that the drums are kind of in the middle right in front of you and the cymbals are kind of pushed out to the sides. And then we'll put a stereo pair of, of overheads and, and often complain that we have too much cymbals in our overheads, but they're right above the cymbals. Whereas a mono overhead is really right above the drum set and it's probably getting a different balance of, of drums versus cymbals. And you can get the same thing with uh, Recorder Man, probably more so than Glenn Johns. With Recorder Man, that's that's more drum-centric than it is cymbal-centric, I guess. Uh, but I find that with a mono overhead, uh, I'm getting uh, everything I need from that microphone. And it's really good. I, I like, I, I don't want to, 
I don't dislike overheads. I, I really like overheads. I just like the way drums sound in overheads better than I like the way cymbals sound in overheads. I find drums sound really cool in overheads where you feel the air and, and you can hear the stick, the attack of the stick on the drums in the overheads. It just sounds a lot more real than, than the close mics. The close mics, we need, we need that tone. We need something to really push into the speakers, but we, we definitely need the realism of the overheads. So here's a mono overhead. Let's have a listen to it. There you go. The thing to watch out for with a mono overhead is that I think we're used to pushing up a stereo pair of overheads and it opening up the the sound of the kit. And uh, that doesn't happen with a mono overhead. A mono overhead, you know, when you push it up, it does feel a little narrow and uh, it might feel a little unexciting to you. Um, what I did was I put myself on like a strict diet of listening to records in mono for a couple of weeks. And... Uh, that solved it. I actually ended up really falling in love with the way mo uh, mono sounds, and I like to mix in mono. Um, so it's just—I think it's just a matter of getting used to it. And uh, I mean, the uh, the Blumline Paris does such a good job of of kind of 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 opening up the stereo image. So now there's there's one mic left. As I said before, I'm only using one kick mic and one snare mic, um, but that's not entirely true. I've got a I've got a, a Cascade Fathead about a foot and a half under the snare drum looking at uh, the batter side of the bass drum. Uh, so this is, I call it the kick snare mic because essentially you have your downbeat and your backbeat on one fader, which I really like. And so yeah, that's a Cascade Fathead. It's going through. I've got this old Yamaha uh, PM430 from the 70s. I was going through that console straight into um, my Focusrite Scarlet, and uh, the, mo the 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 needle isn't actually moving very much on the console, but it, it definitely sounds like it's distorting to me. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, it sounds really cool. Have a listen. Right. So what's really cool about this mic is that um, because it's under the drum set, it's not getting a lot of uh, cymbal information. So I'm not so afraid to add top end on it, which means, first of all, for the kick drum, I'm, without a, a hole in the reso head, I can add top end. This is giving me quite a bit of attack that I'm not getting from the resonant side microphone. And because it's a ribbon, it's giving me a lot of... Uh, uh, the, the proximity effect is pretty pronounced. So it's giving me a lot of uh, low end and an entirely different mid range. So definitely a different cross section of the kick drum completely. So it's, it, it's helping the kick drum feel bigger, but it's also giving me uh, the, that bottom snare sound uh, that becomes really important because oftentimes the drum sound, we'll get the drums kind of sounding really cool. And then once everything is in the mix, we find that maybe the snare drum isn't biting enough. And we're tempted to add top end uh, on, on that snare top mic, but you're inviting leakage, you're inviting weird spitting hi-hat leakage into your snare mic. And I like to add top end to this microphone and then I just, I'll just push this fader up when I need the kick and snare to bite the speakers a little more and to fight through the rest of the mix. And it does a really good job of that. It ends up being really critical to this drum sound working. And I think with this eight mic, every mic has to really pull a lot of weight. You have to get as much mileage out of every microphone on, on with an eight mic setup. Um, but everything works really well together. And it actually, uh, it, for me, it's been absolutely great. So let's have a listen to it unprocessed, but we'll get a balance going. Right. So let's let's go through the mix together now. Um, 
as a part of my template, these two are just always engaged. I'll get to this stuff later, but my when I open a session, I always have the J37 going, and I believe it's on mastering ma mastering fat tight and open, and the noise knob is completely down. And the Abbey Road vinyl is default. I pretty much open it, leave it as is. I just turn the noise knob down. And these add quite a bit. Let's have a listen. I'm going to bypass them. They're adding level, but... They're, they're adding, they're also adding top, bottom compression and obviously harmonic content. So they're definitely doing quite a bit. And when I print stems for clients and stuff, I leave these on. They're a part of, they're really the first line of processing uh, on, on, on the drum sound. And, you know, so they're a big part of it. And uh, I like to move in broad strokes first i like to do you know bus stuff and then kind of whittle down to the uh to the individual tracks so what i'll do now i have my i have these room mics this blumline pair uh bust to a room bus i have the toms bust to a tom bus and then i have everything bust to a drum bus so you'll see i use the waves ssl strip a lot because i really like a streamlined approach um i don't want to be uh kind of making decisions on what plugin to use at every at every point. I kind of want to use a, a small number of plugins that I know really well uh, and that work really well and that are really intuitive to me so that the decisions I'm making are just, does this need top end? Does this need bottom end? Does this need compression? And, uh, you know, uh, and, and I like to move really fast when I mix drums and when I tune drums because I want to keep... I want to keep my ear tuned into the to the big picture of what's going on. I find if I'm if I'm really kind of auditioning little moves and auditioning different plugins for things, um, I, I just it, you know it's like quicksand. I just I get stuck there. And um, I'm using the waves ones. I, I th uh, the the BX uh, SSL actually sounds probably pound for pound might sound better, but I find that when I accumulate all the waves SSL ones, my drums just sound punchier than when I do that with the, uh, and like I said, I don't want to start switching back and forth between the two. So I just, I committed to the waves ones for now. Uh, that's subject to change. <laughs> so here it is. I, I'm using the G channel here. I usually use the E channel because it's got, uh, 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 the option for a bell in the lower band, but on the bus, I like to use the G channel, but just, that's always how I've done it. And I start by uh, scooping out some low mid right off the bus. And I like to do this in mono, actually. I'm looking for, that's closer to 400 yeah, that's one. I'm looking for that, that really hollow sound that I know my car speakers is not gonna like, are not gonna like. subtle and lately I've been liking uh, bus compression on drums and on a vintage sounding kit like this I find the creamer pie works really well um, for a more modern sound I'll, I'll often use the API 2500 from waves but for something like this I find the uh, I find this compressor really awesome Cut it down to two to one, the ratio. So bypassed both of them. And things are tighter. Stereo. Stereo bypassed. Engaged. The snare found a different spot now. The snare was a little more in your face before, now it's a little punchier but further back. 
very useful when you have to fit a vocal in there. So next thing will be kick drum. As usual, the SSL strip. And this will probably look a lot like what you're doing at home or in your studio. I'm assuming you're at home, but you might be in a studio uh, or in a cafe or something. All right, so um, I usually high pass kicks at uh, at around 30, just because I feel like it's a safe move to do. I can't say I really hear it. I just it's become best practice. And I'm cutting some of the weird stuff, the hollow sounding low mid, adding some top end. And I like to send the EQ into the compressor. And I believe this is how you do it. I hope. I'm going to keep the close mics. I generally keep slow attack. I definitely don't want that much compression. I want to see one light come on, no more for, for close mics. So, no processing. And in. And because it's a, it's a kick out mic, I'll, uh, I'll probably use the expander. That's it, pretty quick. Let's stop there for now. Uh, let's go to the snare drum. High pass, add some 8K, add something around 150, maybe a little more high mid for some crack. We're sending the EQ into the compressor. And I just, I just turn these knobs until I get one light going. Whatever order that's in completely depends on what I feel like hitting first. I'm also, because it's an open hat, I will use the expander here. That doesn't always happen. Again, really easy to use, really intuitive. I'll probably lower this because I'll go get some top end from that kick snare mic. And from what I'll usually do is after my uh, my SSL line of attack, then I'll add the Chefs 1073 or the VEQ. And I'll add some saturation, a bit more top end. For the, uh, I really like the 220 band for snares. That has a lot of body. And sometimes I'll cut this 1.5, 1.6K. And I do that, I actually don't hear it much on my, I'm, I, I don't usually mix with headphones, I usually mix on speakers, but in either case, I can't say I hear it that much, but it's something that from taking my mix to the car every day, I just know that my car speakers don't like it <laughs> very much. So I've started blindly preemptively cutting a bit there sometimes just to make my snare feel fatter in my car <laughs> you know so let's move on to the mono overhead what i've been trying to do with uh with ambient microphones like overheads and and room mics is uh i've watched so many videos of of, of chris lord algae and tom lord algae mix and they just seem to add a bunch of top end and bottom end and uh, they, they kind of, they really reshape uh, uh, the overheads and, and the room mics with, with how aggressive they are with EQ. But then I see that they don't touch the mid range very much and I kind of like that they leave the mid range intact. And I will be managing some of the mid range with my mastering EQ after the fact. So I find when I start messing around with the mid range a little too much uh my mix starts to sound a little too scooped and hollow so i'm trying to leave as much of it in there as possible and i'm trying to add more top end than i'm usually comfortable with because my my drum mixes tend to be 
uh, dark. They tend to be a little deficient in the in the top end. And top end is is fidelity and intelligibility, and it makes if if you do top end right, it'll make your drums and your mixes in general sound um, more expensive. I hope so. I've I, I've been starting with like a boost in the top end, and then working from there. That might be a lot. High pass. And the other thing I do with uh, ambient microphones is I like to push a low-end shelf into a fast attack compressor. I saw a video of Greg Wells doing this with a, with a knee mic, and I've decided to do it on everything. So here we go. I'm looking for body, you know. If I find there's a little too much of that whistly quality in the cymbals, I'll turn this green band down a bit. It's usually parked at 3.5 and... Right, like that's where a lot of that whistly character in the cymbals is hidden. So you can turn that down a bit or you can leave it. If, if you're not hitting, it depends on the song, it depends on how you're playing. But a little, but for the most part, let's try to leave the mid range intact. And so here I like to listen to the kick snare and the mono overhead because that's that's the sixties drum sound. That's pretty cool. So from there, let's go to the room mics or the Blumline pair. And let's put on this SSL strip. And let's follow some of those same practices. Add more top end than I'm usually comfortable with. High pass. Add a low shelf. Into the compressor, into fast attack compression. And here as well, I might remove just a bit of that. All right, I think that sounds exciting. So these are just the elements we've mixed so far in mono. There it is in stereo. So at this point, let's put this back in mono. At this point, I'd, I'd like to show you how useful this kick batter snare bottom mic is. So let's let's get that going. Bell. Just pushing a bit of top, bit of bottom. This is I want to keep that attack, so I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep it on slow attack. Sounds about, that sounds pretty cool to me. So let's lower this fader completely. We've got the toms muted, great. And I'll I'll play the drum sound we have, and then I'll start I'll start bringing this fader up so you can see how much it's doing to the to the kick and snare. Right. And. just helping the snare especially bite and it's definitely extending the the low end and the kick let's listen to that in stereo wow yeah very cool let's do a quick tom mix just set a loop up Actually, yeah. So, for toms, I have a couple ways I like to do it. When I'm feeling lazy, 
I like to use something with pre-selected uh, uh, frequencies. So again, the chefs. I'm adding, sorry, for top tom, I add 110. For floor tom, I'll add 60. Add a bit of top end, suck out a bit of bottom, uh, suck out a bit of low mid. Set that high pass. This should have you pretty close. Let's do something similar to the floor tom. It should look almost the same, but with the 60 band instead of the 110 band in the low end. Right, with toms, essentially what you're doing is you're scooping mid-range. Because that can sound boxy. And my secret weapon for toms is a free plug-in called Head Crusher. And I just add a bit of the tone knob and touch the output down. There it is. Without. In. Let's listen to that in stereo. Out. And it's definitely adding a bit of level, but it's also definitely adding quite a bit of tone. So let's put that back in mono. Uh, let's listen to where we're at so far, actually. Mono. Stereo. So I'm going to put it back in mono, and there are just a couple more moves I'd like to make. Um, the first will be a bit of parallel compression. I'd stopped doing this for a while, but I'm back in it. So I'm going to take the kick, the snare, oh, sorry, the kick, the snare, and the toms. So just the typical close mics. Let me make a uh, parallel compression bus. And I really like to use the purple audio from Plugin Alliance. And I hit this link button and then I just push this input until I like I like the way the needles are moving. When the snare starts to sound like the snare on how the West is one, I'm pretty happy. Very chunky. Right? So uh, let's blend that in. Let's get this in stereo. So if I'm, if I'm mixing drums for more of a modern country rock thing or, or a rock thing or whatever, I'll, I might push this one quite a bit higher. Um, if I want the drums to sound more natural and a little less worked this might end up a little lower i mean it just depends that's a little much let's park that there for now uh then i like to send just the ambient mics and i consider the uh, kick snare mic an ambient mic as well i like to send those to a reverb so and Let's use, oh, here, ambient verb. And there's actually a really cool free plugin from Valhalla called Supermassive. And this is a delay plugin, but it does have reverb presets. And I find Lunar Lander 1969, the coolest name, first of all, but also... Uh, a really nice uh, short room for, for drums, you know? So let's have a listen. It's got a bit of a weird phasey character to it on its own, but I find it blends really well with everything. Out. In.
that's one way to do it. The other one, some of the other reverbs I use are the Echo Boy Jr. And this happened when I had a mix going with guitars in it, and I had the guitars sent to this preset called Guitar Room, and then I decided to send the drums to it as well, and that worked really well. Shorter, darker. Nice. And another one I'll use is, they all seem to have echo in them. Uh, the CLA Echosphere, the, the one that was free when they released it. I really like free plugins. So the, I, usually I sync it, but I didn't do this to a click. But I do really like delay on drums. Definitely gives you a, a bottom vibe. So I high pass everything. And on the reverb, I take off the pre-delay completely and I push the reverb time down to one second. It's actually not a bad time, delay time. There you go. Valhalla. Oh, nice. Echo Boy. So yeah, the, the Guitar Room preset is the most out of the way. The CLA Echo is the most bottomish because of the delay in there. And uh, the Valhalla is really cool. It's, it, it gives you like a bright, uh, splashy sound on the snare, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, th there's more we can do. I, I can, you know, sometimes I set up another parallel bus for the drums and go with an H comp and I put the, the punch all the way up to get more attack if I feel like I need it. But for the most part, that's my drum sound. Eight microphones. I don't have rows and rows of plugins going on on the drums. Tom sound really cool. All right, so a uh, quick little EQ thing I do. This is a free plugin called Isolate. Isolate. And I use these BX2098 EQs here. And what I'm trying to do is I find that it's very difficult to make a drum mix translate on a lot of different speakers. And essentially, this, is, this EQ is here to protect your drum mix from, you know, Bluetooth speakers, bad car speakers, iPhone speakers, <laughs> anywhere somebody will listen to your drums on YouTube or whatever, or, or on on songs you've released, or uh, you know, and you want you want your drums to come across the way you're hearing them while you're mixing them. So I try to do this. It's like a protective measure, you know. So what I'll do is I'll start with this low frequency band and just listen to that. And I never cut more than a dB. I'm, tr I'm trying to cut even less now. I'm trying to make 0.5 moves. But then I'll do the same thing with the high mid frequency. All right, that's the stuff that when you when you put your uh, your iPhone speaker really loud, that's the stuff that'll bug you there. And then that I've used up the uh, bell bands on that EQ. That's why I have two of them. And then I do the low mid frequency here. Not too much is bugging me, but something around there. And the mid frequency. Oh, that's annoying. There you go. So it should sound a little cleaner. I don't always find I don't always find that it sounds better, but it is 
immediately better when I'm mixing on these speakers, but it is more protected. I find that when I take it to like my car, but then my wife's car and then my stereo system upstairs and uh, there are less surprises when I do this. Let's have a listen to it on and off. So here they are on. And off. A little more open off. A little more contained. And yeah, so let's have a listen to the drum sound one more time. there you have it eight microphones um what i think is a pretty streamlined approach to drum mixing i hope i hope you agree uh yeah hope it works out for you thank you